Good afternoon. I'm Gerald Levy from Duke University School of Medicine. And for the next 20 minutes, we're going to talk about disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, or DIC, an update. Um, I am also the co-chair of the um, DIC committee for the uh, International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, and it's a privilege to have the opportunity to talk to you in 20 minutes about <laughs> a very complex subject, simplified and updated as much as I could. My disclosures are as follows, not really relevant to this presentation. And what I'd like to do is review the pathophysiology and some clinical aspects of DIC, talk about some clinical studies, therapeutic approaches, focusing on anticoagulation in this time frame, and to modulate some of the acute thromboinflammatory response associated with this complex coagulopathy. So let me start with a, a case, not sepsis actually, but a, a case of a, a critically ill DIC patient, 71-year-old patient who I admitted a couple years ago, 120 kilograms, very large, low ejection fraction, had a coronary revascularization, and on post-op day two, developed pulseless ventricular tachycardia, requiring about 16 minutes of CPR on high-dose vasopressors. We got him back, um, but then urgently went to the cath lab to check the coronaries. Uh, because of the cardiogenic shock, they placed an impella. Uh, the impella is shown here, uh, you can see, which is a temporary ventricular assist device. And because of the profound hypoxemia and white out of his lung, we went ahead and cannulated for VV ECMO in the, uh, the cath lab. A gas in the blood in the cath lab showed uh, a metabolic acidosis, uh, and we were on 2.5 liter sweep with uh, a CPO2 of 62. Sending off additional gases and labs in the lab, he had a profound lactate acidemia. Shock liver, LFTs in the 500s, um, was on high-dose multiple vasopressors and sent a DIC screen like I have been doing for many, many years and a pretty profound D-dimers of 22,000 nanograms per mil. Normal is 500 nanograms per mil with this um, nanograms per mil thrombocytopenia Fibrinogen actually 200s, but uh, INR was 2.8, and xanthrombin was 32%. So this patient clearly has DIC, but an important perspective is that DIC, remember, is a laboratory-based diagnosis due to an underlying cause, not a primary diagnosis. Think about with tissue injury, uh, further endothelial injury, the microcirculatory thrombotic issues that occur due to fibrin deposition with multi-organ dysfunction. And when you look at sort of the pathology, it's a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia on peripheral smear, schistocytes, and all those other sort of activated forms. But the characteristic hemostatic signature is low platelets, fibrinogen is a variable here, but Prothrombin INR elevated, D-dimers are increased, and antithrombin is usually traditionally decreased as well. So remember that conditions and multiple ones are associated with DIC. For us as critical care physicians, over half of the DIC are, are acute infections, sepsis, septic shock. But uh, as a long-term cardiothoracic ICU physician, I see a lot of the DIC post-extracorporeal circulation. Patient arrest, cannulated with, uh, on a temporary VAD or VA ECMO with a reperfusion injury, as in this particular case. Furthermore, multiple causes certainly include intravascular hemolysis, but a common cause is shock liver, usually due to cardiogenic shock or other scenarios, and alone, as well as in combination with DIC, is quite problematic, as I'll show you. Multiple series of tissue injuries can produce this uh, uh, with uh, amniotic fluid emboli and a variety of scenarios, and including DIC is following severe anaphylactic shock. So again, it's due to a secondary disease process. So the coagulopathy of DIC has been a longstanding interest uh, of mine as well as a lot of other individuals, but it's particularly relevant in terms of it taught us a lot about thromboinflammation and kind of set the, 
the, the, the perspective for COVID-19 for those of us who have been following the complex critical illness coagulopathy. This is a really, I think, impressive review article from Julie Helms and her colleagues from Strasbourg, where they actually, in 2017, described the immunohemostasis during sepsis. And the, there are a couple of important points of this slide. One, it clearly shows you the acute adaptive hemostasis to infection with this hypercoagulable state in order to kind of immobilize and sort of sequester the organism followed by a sort of a thrombotic episode and a coagulopathic episode. But most important on the x-axis is the timestamp, because when you take a picture or look at a laboratory set of analyses, uh, it depends where in the course of the disease state what you'll find. And again, having sent DIC screens for many years on patients with acute DIC, it's that profound hypercoagulability, which expanded to uh, uh, certainly in the acute phases of COVID-19. Um, looking at a little bit of a different perspective of this evolution of the, um, what I like, I prefer the term thromboinflammation. It's that all of the pathophysiologic processes of cellular injury mediated through multiple cellular and other host defense mechanisms are brought into play for the acute infectious or other perhaps tissue injury process, producing initially the hypercoagulation, which can move to a compensated DIC and a decompensated DIC, similar but a little bit defined a little bit differently than the prior slide that I showed you. Now, because of the fact that at least over half of most clinicians' DIC scenarios are with sepsis, we and others have developed a specific sepsis-induced coagulopathic definition, primarily because, at least in some countries like in Japan, you get anticoagulants in the initial sort of management strategy. But what happens is that the DIC can progress to what's called overt DIC based on scoring systems um, and it also gives you insight in the prognostication of the injury. Remember, septic patients who have DIC have a 40 to 45% mortality. So one of the interesting things is the concept of thrombin and thromboinflammation is not a new concept. And Marcel Levy and others back 20, 25 years ago described the incredible important interactions. And remember that hemostasis and thrombin generation is a critical signaling mechanism for specifically for acute infectious process. Because not only does it just produce clot, but it's quite chemotactic for polymorpho and mononuclear cells. It's a potent mast cell activator. And remember, mast cells live in the perivascular spaces of the microcirculation, which increase capillary permeability, permeability allowing for chemotaxis, cellular migration, as I'll show you potent endothelial activator, and it can produce a variety of interesting cell injury, including apoptosis, especially in neural cells. So then, that being said, let's describe and go into some of the vascular endothelial regulation of hemostasis, because this is important in a normal physiologic state. This is a light micrograph of a human internal memory artery, came out of my lab at Emory from about several years back. Um, and basically what this shows you is on the top is this brown layer is the endothelium staying immunochemically for nitric oxide synthetase. Our endothelium in our arterial system is an incredibly important organ system that interfaces with blood to provide not only anticoagulation, but also regulating all of the issues and also amplified in thromboinflammation. This is, a, a, I think, a particularly interesting slide that shows you the diverse ability of the endothelium for all of its important uh, anti-thrombotic effects to prevent clot and clot formation. Um, on the top, you see um, we talked about nitric oxide synthetase, but also cyclooxygenase, generating nitric oxide and prostacyclin, inhibiting platelet activation, but also involved with endogenous vascular regulation. Furthermore, on the surface is this incredible network of glycosaminoglycans, which are heparin-like heparin molecules that interact with antithrombin to further pr produce an anticoagulant surface for uh, the arterial flow. Um, 
In addition, thrombomodulin, a very potent receptor, binds thrombin. And remember, a lot of things are done to scavenge thrombin to keep it locally at the vascular endothelial level, as well as the circulating antithrombin that exists in the intravascular space. Um, other receptors include PAR1 receptors when activated release, tissue plasminogen activator, and, and tissue factor pathway interacts as well, inhibitor to prevent clot and clot formation. Damage that endothelium, you go from anticoagulant to pretty profound procoagulant effects with vascular injury, whether it's infectious or whatever particular cause. So remember the toxic effects of the variety of endotoxin, exotoxin, zymosin from acute infectious processes on the vascular endothelium for vascular injury. Um, on the top you see, and this is a, a um, a light microscopic model of tissue flow in, in an animal, but it illustrates a very important point. On the top slide, you see the rapid arterial flow that occurs. You can't delineate the red cells. The cushion that exists between, um, the cushion that's between the red cells and that linear aspect up there is the glycocalyx, and the linear aspect is actually the endothelial structure. Inject endotoxin or with acute infections, and looking at the lower slide, you can see how the dysregulated flow uh, is actually stasis, as you can better visualize the red cells. At the bottom and top, you see how the polymorphonuclear sites are, have actually bound to the endothelium. You've lost your glycocalyceal structure, and you have pretty impressive ongoing microcirculatory injury. Looking a little bit at an enlarged view, you can see the leukocyte platelet aggregates that occur um, and actually, this is early progressive thromboinflammation, soon to progress to actually microcirculatory thrombosis and obviously tissue injury. Looking at this sort of from what the pathophysiologic mechanism is, you can see how antithrombin binds to the circulating glycocalyceal structure on the top. The neutrophils that are actually bound and activated releasing all their very impressive pro-inflammatory constituents, uh, DNA and other things to actually not only try to immobilize, kill the organism, but unfortunately, as we know, inducing injury to the vasculature endothelium and eventually microcirculatory thrombotic effects in the lung and in, in, in other tissues as well. So we talked a little bit about scoring. Um, the, there are probably five different scoring systems that exist. Uh, two of them are actually Japanese scoring systems. Um, the this one that's used most commonly is the IST score, which uses platelets, D-dimers, prothrombin INR, and fibrinogen. And then what happens is, based on scoring, if it's five or more, it's called overt DIC, which is severe DIC. The problem is that you can have DIC with a relatively normal fibrinogen level, like in the beginning of our, our that my, my patient in cardiogenic shock. And as a result, because of the focus on sepsis, there actually was developed what's called the sepsis-induced coagulopathy, or SIC score. The great thing about it, it uses two uh, characteristics, thrombocytopenia, elevation or prothrombin INR, and uses a modified SOFA score to look at critical illness. Now, in some of the Japanese score, they use SIR score, which not used that much. But I like this score because it's uh, a lot of places in undeveloped in other countries, you're not going to get a D-dimer, but potentially a platelet count and at least a prothrombin INR. And it's used to help guide also for potential therapy and therapeutic approaches. So let's spend the final six minutes I have talking about some specific therapeutic intervention. Clearly in DIC, treat the underlying cause. And early intervention with antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals is really important. So obviously shut that response off. The patient comes in septic shock, wide open vasopressors. Um, get your antibiotics in in a couple hours, we've weaned way back to much, much lower doses and even potentially off. In a patient with cardiogenic shock, unfortunately, the inflammation continues on and on. So primary therapy studied 
although unsuccessfully, but still deserves some consideration, is the role of anticoagulation, because I think there's some important take-home perspective. Now, other aspects that have been studied include immunomodulation. Richard Hotchkiss, I was an ICU fellow with many years ago at Mass General, is working on a variety of things um, like interleukin-7, PD PD-1L ligand to amplify the immune responsiveness in patients with long-standing post-septic recovery, but we're going to talk specifically about anticoagulation. There have been multiple studies in sepsis on anticoagulant therapy, from antithrombin, activated protein C. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a, a big discussion of this, of this program, the ISICHEM. Recombinant thrombomodulin more recently, and a variety of other therapies have been given and studied. The problem is you're treating often the thromboinflammatory response after the inciting event. An ounce of prevention works a pound of cure. The bottom line is that, but there is still some interesting perspectives. And let me just sort of remind you in the circulating blood what the highest protein levels are. Fibrinogen at 7 to 8 micromolar is shown on the left. Obviously, we've got a clot, and in hemorrhage uh, and OB and in pregnancy, it goes up higher, clearly to induce clotting. But the next highest protein is antithrombin at a level of 2.4 to 2.6 micromolar on the right side, followed by thrombin on the left at 1.4 micromolar. Thrombin is a critical signaler of thromboinflammation and to help orchestrate this thromboinflammatory response. But antithrombin is part of the yin-yang response as well, and I think just very important, interesting food for thought. Let me just briefly go through a couple of the clinical studies that have been done, and specifically some of the implications and thoughts. For those of you who may or not know, there is the um, KyberCEP study published about 22 years ago, 2,300 patients randomized to antithrombin over about four days load and infusion. Bottom line, in, in the studies, um, no difference in mortality. Uh, mortality was about 38, 39% in both antithrombin and placebo-treated patients. But a sub-analysis of the DIC patients, specifically uh, 230 who had DIC, did not get heparin, had a marked dramatic 28-day mortality improvement. Placebo was 40% um, and 25% in the antithrombin group. The problem with our studies in, in sepsis is that we studied acute infection but didn't study patients with coagulopathy, DIC slash sepsis-induced coagulopathy. Furthermore, again, um, more recently, the recombinant thrombomodulin studies have also did not show an improvement in survival. Um, a very large study that was actually performed called the Scarlet study, which was uh, published recently. But a, the point is that 22% of the patients, the analysis, did not fulfill the standard specific criteria of elevated INR and thrombocytopenia, a positive SIC score, and if you do a reanalysis of the data as shown below, in this targeted population who was coagulopathic, there was an improvement in survival. One of the complications of DIC and SIC is the symmetrical peripheral gangrene or acrocyanosis. Other scenarios like heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, and some of the other thrombotic microangiopathies will produce this. But um, this patient that had acrocyanosis that I admitted also had shock liver. Shock liver is an independent risk factor for acrocyanosis as well as DIC, and there is a large series of data. At the very bottom is a reference from Marcel Levy, myself, Richard Hotchkiss, discussing the potential role where anticoagulation may play a role in this symmetrical peripheral gangrene. So we've all been repeatedly told that high-dose vasopressor produces limb ischemia. I can tell you, working years in a cardiac ICU, high-dose vasopressors for days and days don't affect your limbs from dying or acrocyanosis unless you have 
shock liver, or DIC. And we actually did a, a, a literature review. I worked with Dr. Workington, one of the DIC gurus, um, Bruno Levy, who did the NOREPI study in cardiogenic shock. And basically, um, it hasn't been re pretty much reported in all of the studies of high-dose vasopressors. And they define high-dose vasopressors as anywhere from 0 0.5 to 2 mics per kilo per minute for as little as two hours up to three and a half days. So bottom line, it's DIC or shock liver or both that cause that. So to summarize, the complex pathophysiology of DIC is a profound thromboinflammatory multimodal response um, where there is basically loss in injury to the vascular endothelium. And again, the idea of anticoagulation makes sense in patients who are coagulopathic. So in summary, DIC is a secondary diagnosis. Complex interactions interact are important in inflammation and coagulation. Multiple pathways are involved. I think thrombin modulation has a pivotal role, but in coagulopathic patients. And I think future studies of these patients really require understanding, understanding whether they are coagulopathic and altered specifically to that patient population. I'd like to thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks.